James Bond and The Man from U.N.C.L.E. are two standards for spy movies and television. Do you know the backstories of how these were made? Well, we took a trip to the University of Iowa in Iowa City in the United States to find out. Join us as we talk with Pete Ballesteri to find out why we went there. This is Tom from SpyMovieNavigator.com. Keep listening as Dan and I are cracking the code of these spy classics. We're here with Pete Balistrieri, who is the curator for pop culture and science fiction at the University of Iowa. And why we're talking to you, Pete, is you guys have some interesting collections for spy movie and spy TV fans at the university. And so the two big ones that I know of are the Norman Felton, who did Man from U.N.C.L.E., and the Richard Maybaum stuff, who obviously was the writer of 13 James Bond movies. Can you tell us a little bit of what you have there and what types of things you have for the spy movie, spy TV genre? Sure. My pleasure. The Richard Maybaum papers, definitely filled with all of the uh, Bond materials, everything relating to the Bond films that he was uh, connected to. So complete records of correspondence, different treatments of the screenplay, drafts, early drafts, final drafts, lots of the research that he did for each film in the forms of notes and things like that included. Maybaum also worked on other spy films and films about commandos, World War II commandos and things like that. So that material is in the papers as well. And then Norman Felton, who you mentioned, Norman Felton, who produced a number of hit TV shows, but definitely Man from Uncle. And, you know, Man from Uncle is huge in terms of being that television spy series that tried to emulate the success of Bond sure. and, and the success of the Bond films. And we see all kinds of spy films coming to television during that period. Serious ones, humorous ones like Get Smart, but all of them focusing. But Man from Uncle is one that really captures the public's imagination. And it's kind of like there's a little something for everybody in Man from Uncle. You know, this is the period of the Beatles, and David McCallum is the first television star to have long hair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's British, so he's a long-haired Brit. It's like he's a Beatle and he's a spy. So that <laughs> that's kind of perfect, especially if you were a teenage girl at the time. And they began to put together what is considered the very first media fandom. And that's the fandom that surrounds Man From U.N.C.L.E. And there's a lot of great stories connected to Man From U.N.C.L.E. and its fandom, the great riot at Macy's and other kinds of things. But it's the first media fandom because it resembles the fandoms that came before it, especially science fiction fandoms, where you have conventions, you have fans writing fiction involving the characters. You have people collecting anything related to the show in any way. And of course, Man From U.N.C.L.E. had enormous merchandise tie-ins. There were toys, there were glasses. Lunch boxes. Yeah. So anything that could be sold comes out of Man From U.N.C.L.E. Board games yeah. and we have a number, besides Norman Felton's papers, we have a number of collections, fan collections, of a lot of the things that I just mentioned, including board games and just all kinds of stuff. There's a kind of a gun that the two of you might remember. I'm not sure if they still make them, but it was a piece of cardboard, and then it had a folded piece of paper. And when you snapped your arm, it would pop. The paper would make a popping noise, uh, yeah. and then you would just fold it back up again, and it was ready to go. And so we have a, a man from Uncle Gun, <laughs> uh, 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 like that, that you know that you can run around popping. Okay, so you said you have all of these things. Yeah, these are all in collections that anybody can come in at any time to special collections when we're open and see any and all of these things. So you're in the main library at the University of Iowa. Yes. And how do people make an appointment to come in and, and take a look? Oh, sure. They don't have to make an appointment. That's the beauty of it. And they don't have to be affiliated with the university. They don't have to be from Iowa. Our researchers come from all over the world. And they come for all different reasons. We welcome everybody. So if you're in Iowa City, 
and you want to come to uh, see any of the pop culture things, and we have so much here, it's literally thousands of boxes. Mm -hmm. They can come anytime that we're open and just come upstairs to the third floor and walk in. You don't even have to know what you want to see. You can just (laughs) tell who's ever at the front desk what you're interested in and who's ever sitting there is going to help you to find exactly what you're looking for. We're going to interrupt this discussion here and give you a bit different guidance than what Pete just did now. We were originally planning to go see the collections the first week of August 2022. It turned out that Special Collections was closed that week for training. Fortunately, we found this out by looking at their website under Special Collections Visitor's Guide Reading Room Hours. So especially if you're traveling to Iowa City just to see the collection, we recommend you look there before scheduling your trip. We think this was a one-off because of the school calendar year, but it is best to check before making travel plans. Okay, so back to the interview. The MyBomb papers are restricted, and so if you wanted, let's say, to photocopy or make any kind of a copy of any of the MyBomb Bond scripts, the rights to those are owned by Cubby Broccoli, the producer's company that he started years ago and that his daughter now runs, Eon Productions. So you do have to get permission from Eon Productions, and we help people by giving them the information they need to contact Eon. And then uh, when we see that Eon has given them permission, then we make sure that they can have copies of what they're interested in. If you wanted to come in and just look at what's here, there's no restriction on that. Okay. And it is fascinating stuff. And I will say, you need to give yourself longer than you might think. <laughs> That's right. It, you know, <laughs> some of those folders in there, he's got all these clippings. Yes. And some of them are box office stuff. But then he's got stuff where he's doing research. And like there was an article there about blimps. Mm-hmm. And then three years later, a few to a kill comes out. Yeah. It's yeah, like, wow. You. And so <laughs> yeah. it's just kind of, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea. And it's kind of hard to piece it all together. But yeah. it, takes, it's wonderful. it takes some time. It's wonderful to see my bomb, the researcher, mm-hmm. and to and to see that even with the Bond films, he liked to build plastic models mm. uh, with his son. So when he was working on a film, he and his son would go out and they would buy models of the vehicles that my bomb was going to put in the screenplay. I'm not exactly sure whether he would look at them for inspiration or what the connection was, but when we took in the collection, that little boy that helped to build those models was now a grown man. And to make sure that we took in hundreds of these models, his son wrote a book on the relevance of the models to his father's research for the films that he wrote the screenplays that for. That was Matt, right? Yeah. And we have that book as well. And we still have all the models because we took the models in. It's a fascinating collection and it is just a, a one of many. In terms of other spy films and other spy series, we have quite a few things relating to other spy films and spy series that come out of the fandoms for those television series. We don't have the same kinds of primary source materials. So we talk about primary and secondary source materials. Everything that you can see relating to My Bomb and relating to Man from Uncle, that's all primary source materials. Those came right from the creators. They're all original. They're not copies. When you're writing about something, that's secondary. It's a secondary source. And so we've got a lot of that sort of stuff for other TV series uh, and and, and other spy things, but as I said, mainly coming out of fandom rather than actual screenplays and draft treatments. Though uh, we do have the 20th Century Fox screenplay collection, Mm -hmm. which is thousands. It's close to, I think, 400 boxes of screenplays going back into the silent days. And so there are many, many spy movies made by 20th Century Fox and other studios, and we have the screenplays for all of those films. That's awesome. You know, and sometimes we have lobby cards. Sometimes we have movie posters, things like that. I was was fascinated when I went there, and I I didn't allocate nearly enough time to really get through and do it. Yeah, yeah, there's so much. I'll be back. 
I hope so. It would take hours for me yeah. just to talk about everything that we have. Mm -hmm. And so I've had bond scholars come and spend a week, mm -hmm. just a solid week, eight hours a day, yeah. looking yeah. at nothing but stuff relating to bond. Yeah. And then they go out and they work on their books and create whole chapters from what they've read. And then we've got so many University of Iowa alumni who are involved in film. Yeah. And a lot of those alumni have things that they're constantly donating or that they will eventually donate to special collections. So it just keeps growing and growing. Is there a website that people can take a look at? Uh... They could go to our website. And even though I'm a librarian, an archivist, and a curator, I use Google too. <laughs> so I just, I recommend that rather than like have to click on a million different things, rather than going to the University of Iowa main website, just Google University of Iowa Special Collections. There you go. And it'll take you right to our website. When you're on our website, you'll find two different search boxes right at the top. Yep. One is for our books, and the other one is for what we call manuscript collections. And Tom, that's what you saw a lot yep. of. You can search our manuscript collections. It's a regular search box, like any search box. You throw James Bond in there, or My Bomb, or Man From U.N.C.L.E., or anything you're interested in, and you'll see everything we have. Just to the left of that box is the one for books. And if you put those same kinds of queries or searches in there, you'll see all the books that we have. And it's not spy movies, but I continue to buy all kinds kinds of stuff relating to Bond. There are mashup books now, mashup novels of Bond and Lovecraft, and I've been buying things like that up. The reason that the My Bomb papers are here is because My Bomb was an alum. He started this career in Hollywood, and in those years after World War II, late 40s into the 50s, He's working, building up a reputation, and he gets a chance to do a whole bunch of World War II pictures. And you see those World War II pictures, they start getting made even during the war. Yeah. But they really don't take off as like a solid genre that they're just hitting over and over and over again year after year until we get to like the 50s and even like the late 50s. Yeah, yeah. But my bomb is working, and he's lucky because he gets to start working with a whole little cluster of A-list actors. So he gets a chance to make OSS with Alan Ladd. Oh, yeah. And Alan Ladd's got a good reputation by the end of the war, yeah. and, and OSS is this sort of unknown aspect of the war. So, you know, you could have been a soldier in World War II and not have known about OSS. Mm -hmm. You might have thought there were spies, but, you know, not the way that it's all laid out in that movie. And, and not a bad film. Not a bad film at all. Yeah. And Alan Ladd and My Bomb become friends. And then I think they do another picture together, and I can't remember what that one's called. He does Cockle Shell Heroes with Jose Ferrar. Jose Ferrar, he's another guy. He's got a great reputation. And here he is making World War II movies. If you were a big male actor in Hollywood post-World War II, you were going to make World War II movies if you were still signed to a studio. And so he's developing a reputation as an action movie screenplay writer, someone who's going to deliver good dialogue and good action scenes. And the story is that Cubby Broccoli and Alan Ladd are having lunch together in London. And Cubby Broccoli says, I got the rights to the Ian Fleming spy story, Dr. No. I need a director. And Alan Ladd says, get Dick Mybaum. He's going to deliver a good... Well, like, you say, you say director, he needed a writer. Writer, I'm sorry. Yeah, he yeah, yeah right. I'm thinking, okay, maybe he switched. He needed somebody to translate that book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seriously into a film. Right. And, and so Mybaum takes over. Well, I haven't seen OSS in a long time, <laughs> so I can't tell you whether OSS has that streak... Uh -huh. of my bomb humor in it i don't remember it having that streak of humor in it cockle shell heroes i don't know if you guys have seen cockle shell heroes with jose ferrar that movie has so much humor in it and it's that my bomb brand of humor okay my bomb's humor it's like it's always got an edge to it 
And that edge isn't always apparent because sometimes it's very subtle. Yeah, yeah. By the time he gets to Bond, it's really full blown. If you read the Fleming books Mm -hmm. and then you watch the Bond films, you don't see that humor that my bomb gives to Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. Bond becomes a funny guy. When Bond talks, people smile. Yeah. He's charming. He's articulate. He doesn't bullshit people. Mm -hmm. But this whole thing of slipping in these double entendre, uh, the whole thing of very, very sort of flirtation and sexual talk, but it's always disguised and kind of under the surface. That's my bomb. It's not Fleming. (laughs) So the bond that we fell in love with is my bomb's bond. Yeah, yeah. And so he's the right guy for the job and the success of at least the first three films. By the time Goldfinger is out, I mean, everybody knows this has legs. This is nowhere near the last film. Right, right, right. And then what else is going on? Fleming's not dead. Fleming's alive. And Fleming is still writing. And then you get the whole fantastic, and I, I know I'm going way off track now, but then you get the fantastic triangle, which to me is the ultimate success of the Bond films. And the triangle is Fleming, my bomb, and Hugh Hefner. Because there's so much now that's been written and talked about that says that Hugh Hefner realized that there was no one, no character, no living human being that epitomized, well, besides himself, <laughs> that epitomized the playboy lifestyle like James Bond. So the idea to have Bond girls and that whole thing appear in Playboy before the Bond movie comes out. And so you've got Fleming is still publishing and sometimes publishes in Playboy. All right. So this triangle of Playboy and then My Bomb. My Bomb keeps the ball rolling by delivering on the films. The films deliver, whether it's the sex or whether it's the action, or whether it's just this guy that every, I mean, from adolescent boys through guys long in the tooth, <laughs> you want to be James Bond, at least for a while, at least for like one day, one night. And my bomb is the journeyman Hollywood writer. What you see is he's got a big career. His career goes way beyond Bond to lots of different films and lots of like he did theater so he wrote plays he learned a lot of that stuff here at ui my bomb is endlessly fascinating it's so much fun i think he decided before he died that he wanted all of his papers and everything to come here and it makes sense because it's his alma mater Mm -hmm. They started putting everything together. We're lucky because he saved really a lot of everything. So for every one of those films, you see all the different treatments. You see the different stages of the script. You can really see how it develops. You can read the correspondence that comes from the studio, that comes from the producers, that comes... That's the fascinating stuff where you see... Yeah, the notations and so on. When Tom and I looked at the Ian Fleming manuscripts at Indiana University, that yeah. was the same thing where you see a scratch out and then somebody's name that's now famous was penned in. Yeah. Changed. I mean, that's the stuff that's just terrific. And, you know, that's what scholars want to see, too. All, yeah. they're real, all they're really interested in is seeing manuscripts like that. And yeah. so the, the bottom is falling out of all of that kind of scholarship and research and fun because all the young writers are writing digitally and Mm -hmm. some of them have that word function switched on so that you can track all of the changes most of them don't right what they're sending to their editors are a digital proof copy yeah and maybe it's of a chapter yeah If the editor saves that draft chapter and then they get another one, yeah. If they're saving all of that digitally, maybe someday 
someone will be able to see that. Yeah. But if it resides with the publisher mm. rather than with the author, we're not going to have oh. author's papers anymore. No, I know. That's that's a shame, really, because th that's some of the fascinating stuff. Yeah, right? well, and that's it's, in my mom's papers. It's There's whiteout. It's it's pretty yeah. funny to look at when you think it's about great. what we it's, do today versus what yeah. we do back then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because these old guys were leaving these amazing paper trails yeah. that explain the whole process. Yeah. And, you know, when I'm talking to students and we have these, we have a screenwriting uh, track now in, in film studies. And I do a lot of classes and uh, class visits and, and I show them all kinds of things because we have thousands of screenplays. We have the 20th Century Fox collection that goes from silent days into the 70s that came out of a theater in New York. And yeah. it's mainly continuity scripts, but you still see all the dialogue and all the action. It's just the way that it's laid out is different because they're continuity scripts. But that's everything that came out of 20th Century Fox for decades. Uh -huh. wow. What's so interesting is that when I'm pulling this stuff out, they're not seeing the process. They can see the screenplays, but when they see the process, they get fascinated and I told Tom yesterday, imagine that Connery, who, when he gets that Dr. No role, is still nobody. He's, right. he's nobody. He's, ma he's made some pictures. Yeah. He's working. But I can't imagine that anybody goes to see Darby O'Gill and the Little People and imagines who Sean Connery will become. Yeah. Nobody. Right. <laughs> But, you know, that whole process that they went through and the, the reasons Cubby Broccoli had for picking Connery, that stuff is fascinating, too. Yeah. But by the time we get to Goldfinger, they've had these two huge successes with Dr. No and from Russia with Love. So now Connery's got juice. He's got that Hollywood juice. And he immediately begins to use it. So in a letter to Cubby Broccoli... Connery lays out like 12 things, or I don't know how many things, but he lays out all of these things that need to be changed. He's seen the first treatment, and he's he, there's a lot he doesn't like about it. And one of the things he doesn't like is the role of Pussy Galore. And he says, look, I, I don't understand like why she's even here. If she doesn't have more action, you've got to make this role bigger, or you've got to just get rid of it. I can't remember if he comes right out and says she has to sleep with Bond, or she has to have an affair with Bond, but something like that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, she should go. And Cubby Broccoli sends that letter from Sean Connery to my bomb and <laughs> says, here, Connery's got some... <laughs> changes he wants made well you know nowadays a writer might push back and might say oh no hell no i'm not changing that and you know blah blah that's not my bomb and that's not the times my bomb is a journeyman guy who knows what it's like to work for a studio and knows what side his bread's buttered on and if they want changes they're gonna get changes yeah but i like to speculate and i'm basing this on the difference between the treatment and then you see when the letter comes, and then you see the new treatment that yeah. follows the letter. And suddenly, <laughs> not only has Pussy Galore's role grown immensely, not only is she now sleeping with Bond, he's turned her, and she now has a role in the film that is so important that you don't get the sort of trick ending without her and the fake sleep gas. Right. Uh, fake nerve gas. Right, right. It's not that they thought they were being put to sleep. They thought they were killing them. So to me, that's my bomb <laughs> through the screenplay saying, oh, you want Pussy Galore's role to be bigger? Yeah, I'll make her role bigger. Yeah. I'll make her role huge. I'll make her role almost as big as yours. And like St. Pierre's the process. That's That's the part that is fascinating yeah, about but all, you right? think it's <laughs> more of a, an F you to Sean. I do. Mm -hmm. I absolutely do. Okay. And I feel like what I know about writers after having met so many writers and screenplay writers, and because I, I talk a lot uh, with uh, Nicholas Meyer, and I'm bringing Nicholas Meyer here again in October to, to work with the screenwriters here. You know, they all have like pretty big egos. That's mm -hmm. how they get the work done. 
Yeah. And I really think that they're like vindictive and, <laughs> and when the franchise wasn't going his way anymore, well, that was the end of it. He was gone. Well, they started making some pretty dramatic changes to what he was writing. So, yeah, that's the thing. As time goes by, they're less and less satisfied with his style and things he comes up with. And I think that's pretty common. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Lots of time goes by and they want a new audience. And that means. Yeah, they're responding to social things that are happening and changes in. Yeah. yeah I think that's why we get like the Pierce Brosnans and then the Craigs. Because times have changed. And so I say to these students all the time, what you perceive as aesthetic decisions are business decisions. Yeah. And and if you if you had the archive, if you had their papers in front of you and the letters that go back and forth, you'd understand that these are business decisions that are made by businessmen, not by artists, not by the writers, not by the directors. Right. They're made by business people. So that I think is the same thing. You have like somebody who looks at the times and and maybe yeah. they're younger or they come from a completely different industry and now they're suddenly in charge of a studio or what and they say, "Oh no, no, we need like, you know, we need a completely new guy and and he's got to be different and Yeah. I think that Daniel Craig is more like these times. I liked those movies at first, you know, because yeah. well yeah. I liked Pierce Brosnan for yeah. a long time. I liked Pierce Brosnan and I found out, you know, he's going to be Bond. And I thought, yeah. oh, well, he might be okay. Yeah. Yeah. He bought a lot of Remington Steel to Bond. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, it was that return to like more charm, more sexiness. And the Bond movies always went through this cycle. And it's between espionage focus or action focus or the more charming focus or now it's a ruthless bond, now it's a funny bond. And they went through these cycles constantly responding to the social milieu and yeah. whatever else is happening, right? Yeah. And you're right, because it's all about money. How do we make the most money out of this movie? Oh, and, th and that's the problem with spy movies now is they just turn into these huge action films. Yeah. They forget about the fact that it's supposed to be a spy movie. Well, you know, probably the, and you guys, you guys know more about this than I do because I'm not focused on newer spy films as much as on older ones. But for me, it's that spies have changed so much. Mm -hmm. So we don't think about spies the way that we used to or about spying the way that we used to. And so I think of a movie like Man Who Came In From The Cold. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What a great movie. Yes. Yeah. And the Michael Caine movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And I can't remember what the name of it is, but that George Seagal film. Oh, yeah. Where he's a spy and he's so good in it. And I thought, wow, man, I don't expect anything from you <laughs> as an actor. And damn it, you're a good spy. You're playing a good spy. But things like Man Who Came In From The Cold, I just think of that as an absolutely excellent, excellent piece of work because all it's it's filled with nothing but sort of real spy work, yes. real real spy craft. Yes, yes. Not very exciting. Right. Not, not a whole lot of action. And the action is all up close and personal. Yeah. A pistol, a knife. Mm -hmm. yeah fight no gadgets no yeah yeah and and it's one guy it's just one guy out on a limb roaming around i think that Kurt Seagal movie was the quiller miranda yes you're thinking of. yes that's a good movie <laughs> i think that's a good film and you know i haven't seen it in a long time but i, I bet it holds up i did watch all of the michael caine movies again mm -hmm. uh, and bomber. those all yeah. hold up yeah they hold up yeah. great yeah. Wow. He was, he Berlin. was, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. Right. Such a great spy. You know, you really sense it. Like, yeah, this guy could be a spy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In his own but, way, but different than Bond. In a, in... I don't know if any genre of films anymore that, you know, that's what we're talking about. That's what I deal with all the time is genre. Yeah. I can't think of any genre films anymore that are successful without these huge set pieces yeah, yeah. and giant action sequences yeah, and impossible stuff. I feel like 20 years ago, 
we were laughing at this. I feel like it's more than 20 years ago. To me, it goes back to the disaster films like Towering Inferno. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a society, we said, you know, this is crap. I just don't care anymore about ships sinking, the skyscrapers on fire. You know, who cares? And it was sort of a rejection of things like that. And then I felt like there had been like a huge rejection of what I used to call explosions where you'd like you'd go to see a movie and three quarters of it would be explosions right yeah right right it's like they couldn't make a movie without there being some kind of an explosion yeah right. and my kids you know grew up to like yell the word explosion when <laughs> when something exploded on the screen they would yell explosion but i feel like all of that has been like either forgotten or ignored and we're right back again into this place where you got some stars, you got a little bit of dialogue, but the movie, the real movie, is a series of set pieces. And we watch those set pieces. Now, they wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't successful and they weren't making money. So that must mean that a younger audience is less interested in the overall narrative. What they're interested in is a good five to seven minutes, maybe 10 on the outside of action. Mm -hmm. And so when they're watching YouTube and when they're watching other videos and all they're seeing is clips, when they go to the theater, that film better have at least a solid hour of clippable moments mm -hmm. or where's it going to go? Netflix just released a movie called Carter. Yes. And it is 90% action. It might be 95% action. I started watching it and it was one of those ones where it's like I started watching it yeah. and I and it was like, no, yeah, yeah, no. Well, it, it keeps going. I mean, and it's a bizarre beginning of that movie. Um, it is. So it's a crazy beginning. Yeah. And, you know, I couldn't figure out whether it was going to be an animated film. Yeah, it kind of had a video or a live feel film. It. Yeah, it had a video. It had a video game feel to it. Is it everything. a live film? It's a live film. The video game feel goes away. It's really okay. that opening sequence. Okay. That's video. Uh, so I should an old man should give well, it a chance. Well, I'm I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying that. To me, it was like okay, action, action, action. Oh, we better tell a story. So somebody would give a monologue, and then action, 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 and yeah. it was nonstop action. And so I mean, the action was pretty good. So if you're into action, that was it, it was all right. They're, you know, they're films. Yeah. There's got to be visual storytelling. Yeah. Sure. Films that are dialogue heavy, it's a particular kind of audience that can endure a dialogue heavy film. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Look at the most popular movies now. It's all action hero stuff, right? Yeah. Superman, Spider Man, yep. whatever. <laughs> science, what like. science, yeah. Science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Yeah. And then if you add crime, and crime could be cops, criminals, or lawyers. Mm hmm. It doesn't matter, but anything that's connected to crime mm -hmm. and then romance. Yeah. Because there's always romance and comedy. Yep. Mm. Still really a lot of people going to see romance and comedy. We like to pretend that romance hasn't always been the biggest category, but romance has always been the biggest category. Pulp magazines, romance titles outsold every other title on the stands. Yeah. Sure. And the comics, romance comics in the 70s outsold every other kind of possible comic they had there was that incredible golden period and yeah it fell apart over time but still it's like they can never abandon it and what we know now is that all of the other genre films especially the most successful ones all have elements of comedy and romance in them or they don't go anywhere so superhero comic movies when they got to guardians of the galaxy it was like Bing, 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 bing. You know, here's the winning formula. Yeah. yeah. Yes, there's got to be action. Yes, there's got to be spaceships. Yes, there have to be battles in space and aliens. But there better be some romance. Mm -hmm. And it better be a little bit funny. There's got to be comic relief over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, now it's like the most successful superhero movies are the ones that have those elements of romance. Mm -hmm. and comedy and that's spider-man with tom holland yeah i mean even the craig bonds you know quantum of solace is one inspector where there was no romance at all in quantum but inspector there was some but it was versioning i guess some of the worst bond movies really didn't have that romance bonds yeah. and, and yeah 
as they try to adapt to society today. Yeah. He, he can't be a womanizer anymore. Yeah. He yeah. can't just yeah. manip he can't just manipulate and use women. Right. You know, it's interesting you say that because in the my own papers, there's an article where my own's quoted about that, that we can't have him be a womanizer like he used to be. And he was talking about, you know, because Back when he was writing, it was the world of AIDS. We can't do that anymore. It wasn't the social mores part. It was because of the fact that AIDS is here. We really can't project that out of him anymore. Yeah, and and so again, changing times. Yeah, here's something that, that's to me really interesting to think about. The whole process of updating an older film franchise or updating a novel series. There is no reason why Bond couldn't have always been set in the past right in the time when bond was supposedly alive mm -hmm. and then they just become period pieces right and that's what they did for a long time with sherlock holmes until they decided let's bring him into the 21st century right right, right, right. but if it was going to be about holmes it was about the victorian age it right. was about the late 1800s yeah they and, could uh, have kept yeah bond firmly inside the cold war right mm -hmm. and they decided not to yeah, yeah. i and, think fear of the young people only they, they don't understand anything about the cold war and everything and they wouldn't go see it they'd say ah that's boring i don't even know what that's about and again responding to now the current times and like you said before it's business people making decisions about how much can we get <laughs> yeah yeah exactly well even and, if you look at like the king's man the Kingsman oh. movie, the one that called The Kingsman that they yeah. did, was a period piece. And it did not do as well as the two, no, part of it, it didn't have Taron Edgerton and Colin Firth in it. But it was a period piece kind of right. set things up, and that didn't do as well No, as the more current one. So we'll see no. what, the Bond, what the Bond people do now after No Time to Die. I mean, after they, they ruin the franchise? They may be stuck in period pieces. <laughs> And yeah, I don't know what they're going to do. I think that what we've seen in the past and what we have to be ready for, the death of a franchise. Franchises die. Yeah, yeah. That's the way it is. Dan, I asked Tom yesterday if he was aware of the Filipino film called James Batman. <laughs> no, James Batman. Yeah. Okay. No, so this is an incredible mashup. It's a Filipino film that you can find on YouTube. Yeah. And it's a mashup of Bond and Batman. Oh my and, God. and the same character is both. <laughs> he's he's both James Bond and Batman. It's it's a wild ride. Anyone who's interested in spy films and who's interested in Bond, I think, needs to see James Batman. <laughs> you <Yep>. gotta <laughs> give people credit for creativity. That, yes, you yes, really yes. do. The human imagination just knows yeah. no bounds. And I'm always really impressed by the people who create hybrids, the people who somehow their imagination sees things coming together that you would never yeah. imagine putting together. Yeah. I keep waiting for, if we can have films like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Abraham Lincoln, a vampire slayer, yeah. Well, where is our James Bond zombie movie? <laughs> you know? And maybe Bond becomes a zombie and then has to be cured. Or I want to see Bond in, in some mashups and some good mashups. <laughs> maybe an alien invasion Bond thing, too. Right? Yeah. Bond versus aliens. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. If the three of us saw it in the newspaper tonight, we would we wouldn't even be surprised. Yes, right, that's true. Right. And we'd see it. <laughs> Nicholas Meyer, also an alum. There was a time when if you were interested in writing theater, literature, yeah, or writing for film, Iowa was absolutely the place to come. Oh, and yeah. you know, to a big extent it still is. Yeah. There are so many alums from Iowa who wind up in Hollywood, uh, big names. Oh, yeah. I just well, I just watched another Russo Brothers movie. And the <laughs> Russo Brothers come here, I'd say, like once every couple of years to lecture and to hang out. And uh, That's cool. Was that the Gray Man? You yeah. 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 What would you think of it? So let me tell you that I studied film in school, uh, blah, blah, blah. I've read I don't know how many books about film, etc. So I understand film criticism really well. 
Mm -hmm. because I'm going to be 70. I can still remember when you went to the movies to go to the movies and you didn't care what was showing. (laughs) You went to the theater close to your house. Whatever was showing, yeah. (laughs) And it was air conditioned and you could get soda and popcorn and you went. And if the movie stunk, Who cares? You walked out and you said, wow, that movie really stunk. But it's not that you had a bad time at the movies. And so my standards, though they should be really high, (laughs) if I want to put that hat on and talk that talk, and I can do that. But what I tell people all the time is, do you understand what entertainment is? Do you even have any concept of what entertainment is? means to be entertained to entertain and to be entertained it has nothing to do with quality (laughs) so are you entertained with the gray man (laughs) i was i did an episode on and my comment i said it's an entertaining movie it's not the best spy movie in the world but it's an entertaining movie yes it's it's not a good movie (laughs) and you know what can you say about the Russo brothers? They make entertaining films. Yep. Entertaining, yeah. Are, are they good? Are they good films? Are they going to be remembered the way that other names in film have been remembered? I doubt it. Yeah. And except maybe by their fans, you know, their diehard fans. But to me, it's like I see so many movies. I mean, I'm watching usually at least one or two movies a day, every day. Yeah, And a lot of times it's the same movies over and over, but I'm in a phase now and have been for the last year or so where I'm just trying to watch new films, things I haven't seen before. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm one of those people that I, I love John Carter. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've watched John Carter. Wow. And if I go to a science fiction convention or something like that, and I start talking about why John Carter is a great film, all I get is grief. from other fans and that's when i have to stop and i have to say you know so much of everything you're saying is the bullshit that was said before the movie ever came out yeah yeah there you go have you you know and have you really watched the film Mm -hmm. and you know how many times have you watched the film and then i say well you know i stopped counting somewhere around 15 or 20 times Mm -hmm. and i will still watch it just for the hell of it at least like you know a few times a year and the reason is because that's a damn great film and i've read so much edgar rice burroughs mm-hmm. and i don't think there's ever been a better adaptation of an edgar rice burroughs book than that film hmm. is it the greatest film ever made no could it have been better in different places sure But the criticism about that film and so many other films comes out before anybody ever sees the film now. And that's because of the internet, and that's because of the negativity of fandom. Fandom is so negative now. Fandom used to be about, this is what we love. And now fandom is about, this is what we hate. This is what sucks. These people don't get it right. And Much easier to, to put up negative stuff than positive stuff. Yeah. Thinking. <laughs> so for me, Gray Man and lots of other things just fall into this category that says, I was only interested in wasting time. I wasn't in school. I wasn't trying to learn anything. I wasn't in an art museum. I just wanted something for two hours that I wasn't dying to turn off. <laughs> there you go. And I don't know about you guys, but I've reached that point now where if I start watching that film and I'm 10 minutes in and it's not grabbing me, if I don't have a sense that what I'm experiencing is a slow pace, because I don't mind movies with a slow pace, that's fine. But if I'm sensing that like it's not getting any better than this, it's never going to get better than this, I turn it off. I don't stick with it anymore like I did in the old days. Yeah. Nowadays, right? Now we can just immediately go back and watch what we missed. Yep. All of us growing up in the old days when you'd watch a movie and have no expectation to ever be able to see that movie again. Yeah. Yeah. Like you'd watch it at the theater and you'd know this will never make it to network television. Maybe you might get to see it on the Late Late Show Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, but chances are you'll miss it that night. Mm -hmm. and still never get to see it and then vhs started and then dvds and stores Mm -hmm. and now anybody can just what was that what did he say and you go back 
Yeah. That is like one of the hardest things for me to explain to students mm. that, it's not just that the movies have changed. The experience of right. watching film yeah. has so altered yeah. compared yeah. to what it was. Mm -hmm. they, they don't watch films the same way we do. They don't. My 19-year-old and my 24-year-old do not watch movies the way that we do. They don't. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm watching a movie and I'm into it, there's nothing that could make me take out my phone for any reason <laughs> to look at it to see who's texting no yep. them they can't watch a film unless they're at the theater but if they're at home they can't watch a film unless that phone is in their hand and great scenes will be going on and i'll say what are you doing <laughs> do you realize what you just missed and i don't want to go back and they'd look at me and they'd say i saw it <laughs> you know, and I say, no, you you couldn't have seen. And then, you know, like sometimes they'll say to me, yeah, the guy did such and such. And then he went in the closet. <laughs> and, you know, I have no idea how they were staring at their phone, but also somehow <laughs> saw the scene. Wow. And I, I watched them staring at their phone. So I think they all have developed some kind of like peripheral vision that we don't know about that allows them to look down and look up at the same time. I don't know. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Okay, before we finish, we wanted to give you one more piece of guidance about using the special collections. If you're from out of town and have received the permission from Eon Productions that Pete mentioned earlier, you might want to email special collections at lib spec at uiowa.edu and let them know what you're looking for. They might be able to save you a trip. So, Pete, this was fantastic. Uh, this has been great. Yeah, this and, is tremendous. A lot, of, a lot of fun talking to you, Pete. Absolutely. So, Pete, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for having us there. We enjoy the facility. If anybody's a spy movie fan, especially if they're a Bond fan or a Man From U.N.C.L.E. fan, get out to the University of Iowa and take a look at this stuff. It's fascinating materials. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dan. Thanks so much. See you soon. That's a wrap. This has been Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzotto. With SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Tell your friends about our show through your own social media posts. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and Instagram, too. And subscribe right now. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it.